Well, sure. If, if folks are of the mind that it's my data and data is power and it's my power. And if I give it away, I give away my power. That's a mindset that is 20 years out of date. Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the show today is Frank Winters. Frank is the Geographic Information Officer for New York State. He is the president of something called NISGIC and he has a ton of experience working with GIS in the public sector. And today on the podcast we're going to be talking about access to data. Frank gives a wonderful example of what access to data might mean for unexpected contributors like Jon Snow. And he also shares a few really interesting examples of how ease of access has dramatically contributed to local economy. So just before we get started today, I want to say a big thank you to my sponsor, SafeGraph. So SafeGraph are geospatial enthusiasts just like us. They curate points of interest data, building footprint data, and foot traffic data. And they do all the heavy lifting in terms of data cleaning and processing. So when when you download the data from them, it's analysis ready. So you can do a whole bunch of interesting things with data like this. You can do a competitive landscape analysis, if that's something you're interested in. You might be looking at determining how many visitors came to a specific building, or perhaps mapping population movement. Or maybe you have a completely different use case or analysis in mind. If you know that you need points of interest data, if you're looking for this kind of data for the US, Canada or the UK, definitely check out SafeGraph. And if you want to know a little bit more about SafeGraph, if you want to go a little bit more in depth with how this data is collected, um, check out episode 38. SafeGraph have actually been on the podcast before. If you go back through the archives and look for an episode called Building Geospatial Truth Sets, you'll, you'll find out a lot more about the company, what they do, and perhaps how you can work together with them. Hi, Frank. Welcome to the podcast. Today we're going to be talking about making data available and the benefits of that, not just the benefits to the economy, of course, but to the greater good. And I think before we get into that conversation, perhaps you could just take a couple of minutes to introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Thank you, Daniel. Really excited to be here. So I'm Frank Winters. I'm the Geographic Information Officer for New York State, but I'm also the president of the National States Geographic Information Council, NISGIC. And that's really a, a, a club of folks around the country who are in leadership roles in the U.S. in their states around geospatial. You know, but in our preparation for this, a few things uh, occurred to me. And, and one is that I'm really grateful to be part of this community of folks that have something in common. And that is that we want to leave the world a better place through the use and, and our application and our contribution to spatial data. And now that's a worldwide community. And if you're listening to this podcast, well, you know, you're part of that community. But that's changed for me over the years. Early in my career, I was really trying to work hard and, and make my own contributions. But then it kind of shifted to, okay, well, maybe we can empower others. Maybe we can empower others that we work with, but maybe we now empower other people that we've never met or never will meet. And now that's shifted again, where now not only are we trying to empower others with spatial data, but we're trying to do that in a way that's sustainable and it's going to outlast us and it's going to go on after we're on to, to other things. One more shift in the last, oh, maybe year or so is that we're really focused now on maximizing our impact. So for every minute we spend at our desk or on the phone or in front of a, a, a microphone, how is the world left better by by that time we spend. And that really is about everyone's unique. And I use the word unique carefully. It's not a rare contribution. There's only one set of experiences that you have had that you bring to the table when it comes to figuring out how to apply or make available the spatial data. So how do we do that in a way that we all trust in each other's role so we can rely on each other and just play our unique role? So that's really kind of one of the new North Stars I have. And that's one of the threads that's going through NISJIC these days. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And I think that really speaks to your role, or, or I should say your evolution in this space, right? So you start off on the, on the cutting room floor, working on things where you're hands-on. And then as you move up the ladder in terms of your career, you start to assume a more a, a leadership position and start thinking about the bigger picture. And it's exactly this bigger picture that I want to talk about when we talk about sharing data, making it available in, in collaboration through data. I think one of the really great examples we've seen of this or perhaps the importance of this, has been the, the pandemic. Could you talk to us a little bit about your experiences in terms of collaboration and spatial data during a pandemic? Absolutely. That's a great topic, and, and it's still on our minds. And, and GIS is front page news, and it has been for a year. But I'll start taking you back to 1854 in London. Cholera outbreak 
was devastating. We had an unexpected contributor in Dr. John Snow. He was not an internal medicine doctor. He was a surgeon. And no one really expected Dr. John Snow to be the one that would come up with the answer for a cure for cholera. Cholera was understood to be incorrectly transmitted in the air, much like COVID-19 is. Dr. John Snow had a different idea, and he solved that cholera outbreak, not with test tubes and microscopes, but he solved it with a map. He mapped the location of the people impacted with cholera, and he determined that those people were closest to this particular water well. So when it comes to the pandemic now, 2020, 2021, we've got a tough question to ask ourselves. Are we making data available to those unexpected contributors? And are we making it available at a resolution sharp enough or high enough for Dr. John Snow to have found that well? And in some cases, the answer is yes. In other cases, we're working hard across the country and across the world to be better ready for the next pandemic. The example of uh, Wisconsin, mapping positivity rates by census tract and just making that data publicly available. So then MIT picks up that data and they stick some students on it and they did some wonderful analysis to explain these are the vectors, these are the hotspots, these are the, the types of facilities that are impacting your spread the most. And then another example right here in, in the Northeast U.S. in Vermont, they have, in Vermont is very much a tourism-driven economy as well as some other industries, but tourism is pretty high. And they really carefully study the um, travel restrictions and they used trillions of cell phone tracks for where are people coming from and where is the spread happening? And they really drove policy decisions on travel restrictions based on real live data. I think those are all amazing examples of what we can do when we make data available. The fact is it's difficult to share data, or at least it seems to be, because it doesn't happen very often. We have concerns around privacy issues, for example, that perhaps Jon Snow wasn't facing. Does the risk of not sharing the data outweigh the risk of sharing the data? Well, that's a great question, Daniel, and that's true. That's one of the, <laughs> that's the, the, the second uh, part of that story is Dr. Jon Snow didn't have to be concerned about HIPAA, and certainly our privacy is paramount, and, and we can't be reckless. In that case, I believe that the private data can stay behind the firewall. It can be geocoded, so we take all of the records of the home addresses of people who have been tested or vaccinated. And then you can aggregate those to something like census track. Census track is the unit of geography that the Census Bureau uses to protect privacy under the American Community Survey. So once you've aggregated that data and no longer is it about an individual, it's about a rate in a polygon. We've removed some of that privacy. It's sure your data still is in there, but there's a level of anonymity now. There's reasons to protect data, and a lot of those are codified in law. But there's also some bad reasons to protect data. If the data is just incomplete or, or you think it's too expensive to, to let it out in the wild, maybe someone will crush our servers. And we can get into some of those if you like. Would you mind just staying with that example about the pandemic just for a second? Because I think what we pretty, pretty quickly come down to is the idea of spatial resolution. What kind of spatial resolution should we make this available? And when we think about the pandemic, was it clear which spatial resolution to use right from the start? Or was there some debate around that? It was clear to some of us, and there is debate in the community. Nationwide, the health community has gravitated towards county as a unit of geography because there's county health departments and they collect data by county. And, and that's where a lot of the folks who are expert in something else, and I'm not expecting everyone to be a geospatial expert, but county is the unit of resolution. And that's really useful. And we look at the dashboards on the news and we can see how one county's doing better than another or a travel restriction, restricting travel from one county to another, and that's all good. But when it comes down to the local variances, neighborhood by neighborhood, there's different criteria and the spread was not homogeneous. Now we're into a unit of geography that I would expect the geospatial professionals to be more familiar with. In this case, I'm talking about census tract. There was a great example in Rockland County, New York, where they took the exact same data, they mapped it by county, they mapped it by zip code, they mapped it by census tract, and then they mapped it to a grid cell. And it was the exact same data, and it gave them radically different appreciation of what was actually going on with the spread. That example really drives home the fact that depending what problem you're trying to solve, you're going to need a unit of resolution that allows you to resolve the small differences. That's what resolution really is. Yeah, I completely agree. I don't really want to dive into the idea of protecting people's privacy too much. I feel like that's a topic for another podcast. But earlier you spoke about bad reasons for protecting data. 
we can see a ton of advantages of making it available. You talked about the, the effect of the unexpected contributors and gave that wonderful example with Jon Snow. Can you talk about some of the wrong reasons for protecting data, for, for hiding it away, making it unavailable? Well, sure. If, if folks are of the mind that it's my data and data is power and it's my power and if I give it away, I give away my power, that's a mindset that is 20 years out of date. We can get our power by empowering others, right? And if people, what scales, right? We talk about our computer architecture scaling, but how about the use of our data and our impact scaling? And can we put it out there so thousands or millions of people have their job some tiny bit impacted by the availability of that data? That's where it really takes off. Now, other reasons are that there's a lot of people who are very detail oriented and do a great job getting their data dialed in. But does the data have to be perfect to be useful? It might be perfect three years from now, or it might never be perfect because you're always, you're never going to be satisfied. So you can put your data out in a way that works. And as you refine it, it just works better. For instance, our address points, we have a dot on the roof of some 6 million addresses in, in the state. Now, sometimes that's not good enough. Sometimes we need a dot on the entrance. Apartment one through six will enter this door. Apartment seven through 30 enter in this door for 911 purposes. We don't have to have all those sub addresses all figured out and dialed in in order for the dots on the roof to still be useful, right? So there's an example of we're not going to wait for the data to be perfect. We're going to eat on the way to the dream. We're going to make, do something useful and then keep refining it as we go, as the business requirements and the cost benefit drive towards that. So that's an, another example of strive to get something useful out on the way to making it better and better. For me, what, what this normally looks like is, hey, we've got this data, we're going to make it available, but it's really difficult to get to. It's going to be difficult to find. We're going to hide it somewhere deep in, in some like really archaic, difficult to understand portal where it's difficult to search, or we want to know everything about you and we want you to commit to, a, to giving us your firstborn if you want to have access to it. And I guess the thinking being here is that if you make it difficult for people to, to use it, then that perhaps they won't use too much of it. Maybe it won't cost us too much. Maybe they won't crush our, our servers with, with their demand. <laughs> That's pretty wonderful. And, and that also, you know, you think about the folks entering the workforce now. I've got a, a, a couple of young adult professional sons. They don't call for a pizza, yet they get pizza, right? And if your pizza <laughs> ordering system is not available and they can order it in about 10 seconds on their phone, they're going to get their pizza from somebody else. Right. So you think about those folks entering the workforce and the expectation that they have to make a, a phone call to get your data or, or sign a license agreement or those sort of things. Those days are, are really numbered. Right. So I believe that it's actually cheaper and easier to make data publicly available and support the computer infrastructure to do that in an efficient way than it is to manage the user accounts necessary to constrain its access. And certainly web services are um, a big part of that. So you should be able to use your standard web search, find your data you're after. I'm looking for parcels in New York State. Here's the explanation of how to use the web service. There's a URL. You plug that into your GIS software or as a developer, you plug that into your app and it's a URL that just waits for that data to come at you as you need it. There are really, really nice ways to remove those caveats but it's up to the data author to be clear about, here's my data, here's how it's to be used, and we can get into licensing if you, if you like. There, there is a need now to be very clear about how someone is to use the licensing, to use the data through licensing and move right on. So just to be clear, you believe that the, the burden of that complexity of, of scaling with scaling need in terms of infrastructure and the burden of complexity of filtering the data and presenting it in a way that the users can just come and take the data and be done with it kind of thing. That rests on the people in the back end, the people in the back office. Do you have any examples of that working? Do you I think you talked about a geocoder before? Is that the way you run your geocoder? It's just wide open? Absolutely, it is. It's interesting. We have a team of eight people, and last week they made 9,000 edits to our streets and address data. The streets and address data is the underpinning of the geocoder. Geocoder is just a URL, it's just a web link sitting out there. You send it an address, it sends you back a correctly spelled address if you, if you were close enough, and it sends you back a coordinate. And that's all it does, that one simple thing. And we have that publicly available, and all that activity, all those addresses coming back and forth is activity in New York State. So we have, it might be somebody delivering a pizza. Well, if that pizza got there a little bit hotter and 
you know, we've improved the world a little bit there. Or it might be someone finding a daycare center or issuing a chemical storage permit or you name it, all this activity. And that data is now also all lined up to go into different systems to support 911 dispatch. So we make that data publicly available, but it's a really live data set. And how do you make 9,000 edits in a week with eight people? You don't. You do it with 200 partners. So we have every addressing authority in the state working with us to keep that data fresh and to continue to improve it. So that's complicated. But the simple thing for lots of folks that can't bear that complication, they have other jobs to do, is that URL sitting out there. So if I'm a developer and I'm writing a little web form and I need to ask a customer what their address is, you can just hit that URL and you say, hey, did you mean this one? And now I've got it properly formatted and, and spelled correctly. And now if I also have to ask the uh, customer which county they're in, I can leave that off my form. I can now take that coordinate. I can bounce that off of another web service to say, hey, what county is this? Drops a point there just as if you had clicked your mouse on a map. And now the county comes back. And St. Lawrence is always abbreviated the same. And if not only have I made my user interface simpler, I've also improved my data quality just by interacting with the spatial data. I never looked at a map, not a GIS expert in that case. I'm a developer and we're talking APIs to developers and we're talking GIS web services to the GIS professionals, but it's the same thing. So if you came to me with the idea, if I had to sign off on this contract and your idea was, hey, I'd like to support an architecture for a completely uncontrolled demand of my geocoder, I would need to know a cost and I would want to know a sort of a cost benefit for that, like either for our organization or for the, for the greater good of the, the community that we were serving. Can you talk me through how you would explain that sort of cost benefit to, to me? If I had to sign off on this? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And when I say uncontrolled demand, we certainly have some security protections in place to avoid denial of service tax and, that, and those sort of things. But the cost benefit is a really great question because if we can make enough data out there to move the dial on the economy, so in this case, we're making New York one tiny percentage more attractive, easier, more efficient to site a business, to do site development, we've improved our com economic competitiveness and improved our efficiency, if we can do that and move the dial just a tiny bit, we've paid for our salaries and all our infrastructure over and over again. The best examples I have there are around our parcel data. I'll start with a statement of respect. There are local governments that have various policies, and it's their prerogative to, to have various policies on how they control parcel data. And, and they're doing that out of a sense of stewardship. We've added some, some new information to that to make it compelling that they give us permission to share their parcel data publicly through these web services. About half the counties in the state have said, yes, go ahead and share our parcel data publicly. Now, an example of, uh, from Rensselaer County, New York, and this was some statistics from 2015 to 2019. So before Rensselaer County made their parcel data public, there was 127 downloads of their data through a data sharing agreement that we have in, in the state. The year that they made that data public, it went to 2,730. So clearly more people are downloading the data once it's public. We looked at the, at the web logs and determined what type of businesses, what type of URLs really studied who was downloading that data. And we found out that 854 of those downloads were from businesses. One of those businesses was Amazon. And in 2018, there was an Amazon distribution facility that was applied for and now is open in Rensselaer County. Amazon put another facility up in the state. It just happens to be another county that makes their parcel data publicly available. And they had also downloaded their parcel data six months before that project started. So we've been told by the economic development experts that municipalities or regions have been left out of consideration for some economic development projects simply because their data was not publicly available. The timelines for making those decisions have shrunken to a point where they're citing facilities where they can grab the data and make a decision and move on, right? It used to be months, now it's a day or two. Now back to that Amazon example, not everyone in the area thought that uh, putting a facility there was, was a great idea. There was a neighborhood group that also downloaded the parcel data to hold the developer's feet to the fire because there was a regulation that if they're going to do blasting on a site that all the property owners within a mile had to be notified. So they used the parcel data on the other side of that debate. Well, isn't that wonderful now that it's it's just not 
a deep pockets company that has access to the data, but it really leveled the playing field for a reasonable discussion that the neighborhood association could also have the parcel data for free, right? So the stories go on and on. There's several examples that we've uncovered with a company that has downloaded or accessed the web services and now economic activity happens. An example of uh, another company, Regeneron, is a pharmaceutical company, also downloaded the parcel data and then opened a facility in Rensselaer County. The first Amazon facility, 800 full-time jobs. The second, and their tax uh, increase of uh, $1.5 million a year to the county, that's after county and, and town taxes, that's after the investments the county made to handle the load and facilities. And Regeneron, uh, 1,500 jobs created in that area. And we've had conversations with some of the more rural counties in the state. And they said, well, okay, yeah, sure. That's, that's Rensselaer. They're, you know, they, they get those kind of activities. Our county is situated in, in, a, in a place where we don't have those kind of opportunities. Well, then we'd ask the question, okay, well, what about your ability for your citizens to connect to the internet? Do you have universal broadband? And wouldn't it be useful to broadband developers or even solar energy developers to understand the property ownership in order to better plan for the expansion of those facilities. So I think over time, there'll be more and more of those decisions that we respect will head towards open data. The soundbite I like to use is that if your data is behind a password, you've left your constituents out of a segment of the economy. Isn't that really interesting that data can be considered that parameter that could change the indecision, right? So back in the good old days, we looked at roads, what does the access look like? And how are we going to transport goods to and from? How are we going to get our workers to and from? What does the housing situation look like? Can, are there places to live? And now we're looking at what's the availability of data? Can I make a good decision about even starting an investment in this area? I think that's absolutely fascinating. It is, and that's nothing I would have predicted. <laughs> Here we are. We live in this world of cloud architecture, right? So we can go back, and I, I want to sort of focus on this word uncontrolled just for a second. The idea of uncontrolled demand. We, we can meet that demand because we can, our architecture can scale, you know, in theory anyway, up to infinity. It can get bigger and bigger as the demand increases. What does the demand look like on the human side? Does that have to be just as scalable as your architecture? You hit the nail on the head with the, with the question, and that's really where the strategy comes in. If I have to add another staff member for every thousand GIS users, I've failed, right? Because I will not have the ability to, to scale my workforce to come anywhere near the kind of demand that we're hoping the use of our web services. So we have to set things up in a way that people can just self-serve. So we have to have simple but really clear documentation. We have to have URLs that are kind of caveat free. And I think one of the keys to that is to not try to do too much. Our geocoder does one thing. You send it an address, it sends you back that address correctly spelled and gives you a coordinate. People say, well, can you have it also return the school district? My answer is, yes, we could, but no, we're not going to. We'll have another service that is just the school districts. You send it a coordinate, it sends back the school district. You turn it on and you want to see a map, there's your map of school districts, right? So we can stack up a synergy of very simple things, each one very understandable, but we don't make it overcomplicated by trying to do too many things in the exact same service. We stack up a whole bunch of kind of microservices. I'm a little bit curious here. Are you creating a demand? Are you actively educating people that, hey, we're doing this thing here. It lives over here. This is the way you access it. You talked about the documentation before, but that's once you have arrived on the website, right? So you've already found the thing that you're looking for. You understood that you were looking for a geocoder already, and then the documentation did the rest of the education. Or are you simply reacting to a, an existing demand? So are you creating demand or are you reacting to an existing demand? Another great question. And the answer is both. One really nice thing that we have and we've had for two decades in New York State is a geospatial advisory council. And that has representation from every sector, most heavily weighted with local government, the private sector, academic, federal, and state sector folks. We get together deliberately, quarterly, and their role is really to advise me and our programs. So for decades, we have been taking the pulse of the community, listening, having them understand what we're up to, and then having them shape what we, what we do. So the things that we do are largely driven by the community. And that's very similar to the kinds of activities that NISJIC takes on nationwide and works with federal agencies and, and our private sector partners to, to understand which way the industry is going, to shape that. So both nationwide and in the state, 
we proactively go out and, and understand the demand and understand what's coming and understand what's, what's really next. But then there's a whole bunch of folks who are not part of our community. So there we have to, and, and we have to do more and more of this. And that's really where the, where the growth is that I see and our challenge is. I want every developer in the state to understand how to interact with our web services. We're not there yet. That'll take a lot of outreach. That's one of the reasons that spending time with you today is, is so important. You know, if there's people that might find out about this strategy and visit our web services and have some use just because they've plugged into this podcast. So I do a lot of this kind of thing as well. So it's a combination of understanding the business needs of those we can serve, understanding what our role is, understanding whose lane to stay out of. Like I'm not wet mapping wetlands. That's our Department of Environmental Conservation. We could, doesn't mean we should, right? And setting up those kind of trust relationships so that I know when I need wetlands mapping, I can go to them. And when they need orthoimagery, they can come to us. And we can both focus on the pieces that we are uniquely qualified to, um, to line up. So there's an awful lot of outreach. There's an awful lot of partnerships. There's an awful lot of miles on rental cars necessary to get all these partnerships all lined up because there's nothing like showing up at someone's office. And I really miss that. And you know, this year we haven't done very much of that. I really look forward to getting back to the face-to-face meetings, the handshake, have a cup of coffee with someone and sort out how we can both play the best role. Combination of all those things. I just want to say, I think that's really cool that you're reaching out to developers and trying to spread the word. And I think getting back to that statement right at the start about the unexpected contributors, I think that is going to be really interesting to see what those people come up with, right? They're not sort of burdened by knowledge, <laughs> if you will, right? We, we In the geospatial industry, we have sort of set ways that we do things. And I think it's really interesting when people show up and they're just trying to solve a problem and they're not sort of held back by the, the baggage that, that we might have. And I, I think we'll see some really interesting and creative solutions come out of that. This all sounds great, right? So it sounds like an amazing approach. It sounds like it's working. Why aren't more people doing this? For me, it seems that the overwhelming response to this kind of idea of making data available is to make it, sure, it's available, but it's, it's difficult to get at. It's available with a whole bunch of restrictions. Why do you think more people aren't responding to the need for data in a similar way that you are? Well, I think that there's more, there's more of a trend towards open data than most of us realize. And that's been one of the, one of the hallmarks of NISJIC's strategy over the last several years has been to remove some of those barriers. And the passage of the Geospatial Data Act is a really interesting piece of legislation that compels federal agencies who invest in data to do that in a way that's coordinated with the states and leans towards making more data openly available. I think we'll see more and more of that. But one of the things that was kind of a revelation in the last year or so is that the lack of common licensing, and it seems strange that I'm talking about licensing when I'm also talking about open data, but the lack of common language for folks to understand, here's exactly how I expect this data to be used, even if I try to put it in the public domain, if I've got my own words around it, and attorneys say I'm I'm running a commercial mapping activity, and I have data coming in from all around the world, and I want to be clean about, do I have permission to use this data? Well, I might send a a license agreement to everyone that might contribute. I get a license agreement from one of those contributors, my attorneys are going to say, aren't you making that data publicly available? We can't sign that license. So what we've come around to, uh, and, and this is fairly new, but Creative Commons licensing, there's different versions of that, but Creative Commons Zero is a standard license around the world. And if I publish data with Creative Commons Zero, no one needs to review it again. If they already have looked at the terms, we know what that is, we move on. So by being clear and consistent about the terms of a license, not only does it help remove the need to keep reviewing that, but compliance to that, to those terms goes up. If I have a hundred partners and every one of them has tweaked the license and given me different wording on how I should control the data, how do I pass that on to, to my users and to my staff and say, okay, there's a hundred different things to think about. And depending which area you're in, you have to think about something different. Where if we come together and say, if you're putting data in the public domain, use this CC0. Now we're all on the same page and I can tell folks, here are the terms of CC0. These hundred things all apply to that, right? So that's one of the things we're starting to tackle now is what is, are the license terms? And sure, there are some contributors to this ecosystem that we have, our data ecosystem, that are in this to, as a commercial venture. You know, I'm going to buy imagery that's, that's taken every day. And a company's saying, well, if I put that out for free, how do I, 
how do I do this next year? My company is going to go under. So their license terms really is a responsibility they've taken to be clear about how we can and can't use that data. And it's the licensing, a key part of data governance, that really allows that trust relationship that I talked about to happen. I am clear about how you expect me to use your data, and here's how I expect you to use my data, and here are the caveats. We've worked hard to remove them, but you're not going to rely on this as being perfect, for instance. You're not going to rely on a warranty from me, but go ahead and knock your socks off and use it. You know, it's those license terms. That's kind of the next hurrah for understanding a consistent approach towards publicly available data, as well as commercial, somewhat restricted data that we can use. So I know we've talked about a lot now in our conversation. We've come a really long way. If you had to think about what the biggest problem might be in terms of spatial data, collaboration, sharing of data in the US at the moment, which one of these broad categories would you put it into? Would you consider the problem is around policy or around the, the tech side of it, the, the architecture needed to, to realize this? Or is it a, a cultural problem? Like the people that are responsible for this data haven't really got their heads around that it's better to share than to, to sit on it. Yeah, another great question. I don't know that I have a really clean answer to that, although I can, I can tell you that it's not around technology. We have plenty of technology and we are just struggling to, uh, to keep up with the trends. So the technology is going to continue to be kind of the easy part. I believe that, and I'm optimistic that the trend is the right direction, that people are starting to get their heads around it more and more. I think that there's a public perception around privacy that uh, we have to be really respectful of. And I think we're going to see that there's a, a move towards anonymity as opposed to privacy. So sure, my data is part of this, but I'm anonymous in it. And I think about other parts of our industry. I've got a box of CDs in my basement, and I love that music, and I bought my own copy. And I haven't opened that box in five, 10 years, right? But I subscribe to an internet music service. I can get any music I want. Well, other people, like my kids can, can see my playlist. I've connected with them, right? So there's no privacy there. And there's not really an ownership. It's a subscription there. But I'm super comfortable with that when it comes to my music. Am I just as comfortable when it comes to my spatial data? I think we've got to bridge those gaps. Right. So I think we're going to see more and more of it. I'm pretty optimistic. But privacy is something that we really have to be respectful of. The industry is changing in a way that uh, we'll see people being really deliberate about their decisions and understanding that, wow, I have to look over the horizon a little bit and look beyond my office walls or beyond my agency to see what the impact really could be of the data. I have. Yeah. And I don't think we can emphasize that the importance of privacy too much. You know, you know what I mean? I think it's incredibly important. But I also think it's really important to understand what we're saying no to when we don't share our data. Personally, I feel like there's been a lot of really massive companies out there that haven't kept their promise. The promise was, if we share our data with you, you will take that data and you'll use it to make things better for us. And then it turns out that they haven't been keeping their promise. Things didn't get better for us. In fact, they got worse for us. I think that in the same way, when you open up your services and say, here, please use my services, you explain the benefit of that to people or people can see the benefit of it. They, it's not hidden away. And I, I think that if we do a better job of explaining the benefits of doing this, so in terms of the COVID response, I think the benefit of us sh sharing our data, where are we now, outweighed, at least in my own personal opinion, the risk of doing that. I was sharing it with an organization I trusted and my hope was that they're going to take this data and make things better, respond in a better way, save lives, that kind of thing. It is a barter system. It's always going to be that we do this and we get that back. And it's going to be a question of, are we good enough at, of explaining the benefits to people in such a way that they can understand it? Absolutely. And, and I think a, a good dose of empathy needs to come in there. They need to understand it in a way that resonates for the things that they are trying to accomplish. Back to the address example, I'd like to ask that, and, and we had interactions with a lot of the folks who manage the 911 systems because the data that we needed to build these address points in the first place was rolled up in the traditional landline 911 systems. And we asked the question, okay, how many, how many transactions happen at your address? And what percentage of those are 911 calls? Hopefully it's very, very low. And wouldn't it be great if we exercise that data through lots and lots and lots of transactions and we absorb that feedback and we use that feedback to make sure that we've got your address right so that when the 911 call happens, this is not the first time we're, we're responding or using that address to find it, right? So whether we're collecting census forms or delivering pizzas, 
we've exercised that that address and we've got it right. Right at the start of the podcast, you you sort of mentioned that journey that you've been on and your uh, the change in thinking that's happened for you throughout your time in the geospatial industry. When you think about the industry in general now, if we sort of get up on a helicopter fly up and we look down, are you still just excited about it as you were when you entered into it? I know, for example, your son's involved in, in the industry now too. Do you see a bright future for him and, and others in, in a similar position? Oh, absolutely. And it's been a funny, funny, um, you know, I look back in my career and I just shake my head. My first mapping job, I was in a canoe and I was collecting water samples around the clock on some 30 points. And we, we worked 24 hours straight to collect water samples for this dye study in Lake Champlain, which was a kind of an environmental impact study. So I collected 30 points and I'd say hmm, six people used those, that data. And I was really proud of it. And it was it was great. I, I was kind of uniquely qualified to be up all night and paddling around with my headlamp on. And, you know, but that wasn't going to pay the bills. And that wasn't my, my biggest contribution. And now we're collecting millions of points. And we're on pace to come close to a billion interactions with our web services in 2021. I don't think we'll be quite there. But we had 75 million hits on our web services last month. And we'll be 75 million hits last month. We could be close to a billion hits in 2021. Some of those may be frivolous, right? People just just messing around on the internet. Some of those are people planning their camping trip or citing a facility. And, and we and we just have to have faith that and we and we know that there's a lot of really exciting things that people are doing because it scales so widely. So the industry really has changed. There's been players that we kind of in what we looked at as the core of the industry are looking around going, oh my gosh, the autonomous vehicle industry, where are these folks coming from? Where are they heading? And um, these big mapping companies, you're selling cell phones, uh, you know, partly by the marketing around whose map is better. And over the last couple of years, NISJIC has really pulled that community together in really exciting ways. For instance, an exit number changes on a road. We're setting up a structure where all of those commercial companies commercial map providers can right away see that it happened and we make the road safer because people experience something in the virtual world with their directions that they're experiencing that day that it opens in the real world. And those connections are are super exciting. So I am even more stoked about being part of this industry than I was when I decided that grad school was a thing. And it's funny because I I remember to this day, (laughs) my mission statement for on my grad school application. And I knew we had to write a, a mission statement. And I told my kids, don't try to repeat this. Don't try to figure out as you're in your education mode, what you want to do the rest of your, your life, because you're just going to contribute in lots of ways. And it all goes into the same brain and just go make a difference. But my grad school application said on it, I want to learn everything I can about how geographic data is collected, analyzed, and portrayed. And that was just broad enough that it still holds up today, but it's just focused enough to give me <laughs> to give me that drive and it still holds up. <laughs> That's amazing. It's really amazing. If you have to think about your own career where you are right here, right now, what is the most uh, important skill that, that you have? What, what's the thing that you use every day that you couldn't be without? Clearly empathetic mindset and kind of the role of the translator. So I have to meet people where they are or else I don't get the value of their insights and they don't get the value of using our stuff. So we have to talk RGB values to the graphic artists. We have to talk APIs to the developers. We have to talk environmental impact to environmental specialists and public safety to the, to the police, but we have to understand enough about what they're trying to do so that we meet them where they are. And and people use the term, you know, we, we've got to dumb this down. Well, no, no, you don't have to dumb it down. You have to make it applicable for somebody who has a very different things on their mind right? To, to put a user interface in a police car when police car is on the side of the road in a dangerous situation with all the things that that officer has to keep track of, what laws they're enforcing and what the potential dangers are. And it's really an intense situation. The interface has to be ready for that. And if it's the slightest bit hard, we've missed the mark, right? So being empathetic about how does the work that my team does impact someone in a way that they can consume it as part of the job they're trying to do. That's the skill that I think is most exciting. Frank, I really want to thank you for your generosity. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for showing up today and sharing your insights in such a way that you know, we can all understand it. I, I really, really appreciate it. Is there anywhere folks can go if they want to uh, reach out to you personally, if they want to learn more about your work or just continue this conversation? Oh, absolutely. There's a couple of organizations. 
gis.ny.gov is the website. My contact information is sprinkled throughout that. And also you can connect through NISGIC. That's the National States Geographic Information Council. And we'd love to have you plug in there as well. Thanks again for your time, Frank. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, and, and thank you, Daniel. This has been <laughs> this has been really fun. And uh, you're really leaving the world a better place by uh, helping us all get the word out. So we really appreciate that as well. Thank you very much. Once again, a huge thank you to my sponsor, safegraph.com. So these guys do an incredible job of curating uh, points of interest for the UK, the US and Canada. And they do a ton of work for the community in general. They are one of the founding partners behind the Place Key initiative, which is worth checking out if you haven't heard of it before. And also they have built this thing called the Data Consortium, where they've built a community around academics working on their data. So they give free access to academics and a, a lot of support as well, which I think is absolutely brilliant. So if you are in the market for points of interest data, check out safegraph.com. I'll put a link in the show notes to make it a bit easier to find. And just realize that by supporting SafeGraph, you're also supporting all of the great work that they're doing for the geospatial community at large. And that's it for another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in again this week. It's much appreciated. If you want to reach out to me, you can find Mapscaping on Twitter. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Just search for host of Mapscaping, something like that. You'll find me. Or if email is your thing, you're more than welcome to contact me on info at mapscaping.com. I would love to hear from you. Okay, that's it from me. We'll talk again next week. Bye.